our coach and helping like an organization for both small and large to go through like agile transformation and teach them how to uh, be agile. And um, this talk is a uh, compiling from our experience and from observation uh, uh, for, uh, and from, from both of us together. So uh, if you talk about a buzzword um, in the past four or five years, I think we have seen a lot. For example, um, FinTech, uh, Big Data, Thailand 4.0, or anything 4.0, um, Blockchain, AI, and, and one of the uh, recent one is digital transformation. Um, it's not new, but it's uh, become like a talk of the town in the past like year or two. So it's a trend that organization, they know that they have to adjust, they have to change uh, the way that they think, the way that they work for both internally inside the company and also to, uh, to external, to uh, giving the digital experience to, the, to, the, to their customers. Um, some of the organizations start that with, with that uh, with the agile transformation. And oftentimes they start with like small, they pick a pilot team, uh, ma making them do a pilot project. They get endorsement from the management. Um, they get uh, like a small project, maybe with the, uh, even like isolated from the whole, whole organization so they have uh, freedom on work. Um, when they present it back, maybe after half a year of few months to the management. Everyone feel, feel love it, they, they're happy. They, um, they feel that they are value, their opinion are value. They have their own, um, they can control every decisions that they have. Um, they got a project out, the customer love it. They get to talk to the customers. They can come in any time that they want. They can wear like jeans and t-shirt to work. Um, and they told the management, this is the way to go, we love it. So the management get excited and say, okay, that's great. Let's get it to the whole organization or a bigger group of the organization. But once they did that, it didn't turn out well. And I can kind of uh, list out some of the symptoms that, that I have seen. Only a few teams made it. Only only few teams like, like finally made the uh, product and, and shipped it out to in either, either internal or to the external. Um, there are lots of meetings, so many meetings, so many ceremonies that are happening uh, between teams and within teams. Um, it clashed with the existing, uh, I call it gatekeeper process. And when I say gatekeeper, I, I, I mean that how the process that they, um, they take place to control something. For example, if you want to start a project, you need to submit a full list of requirements, like how many servers do you want, like when is the uh, release date, how many resources that you need. Uh, once you pass that, um, you have to produce maybe functional specs so that someone can review it and make sure that it, it, it's okay. Before you launch, you have to go to the order ceremonies of like user acceptance test or maybe it's a staging test first. Uh, before you re release, you have to go to all the committee review. Um, those process are there for a reason. And, and, and when, when, when we come to Agile, we kind of try to lift those up. And if you not control it well, it will clash with each other especially when some, some teams that they have to work with the Agile team and with the traditional way. And I can talk about it afterwards. Um, with that, the moral of the whole team will drop. They ended up um, uh, having a roadblock or they, they need to uh, um, do some compromisation. Um, at best, what they get is the um, incremental delivery, not the iterative delivery. And when we, what I mean by incremental, it means you get things as you plan.
plan ahead maybe in like the next six months, this is what you're gonna get. Um, it's not bad. They, they get to enjoy the, 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 the value early and they can, they can, they can um, continue us getting the value from, from each of the incremental release. But they cannot get into the point that they learn from the feedback, come back, respond to change, and iterate uh, their ideas. Or if startups, they use the term pivot. They, did, they didn't get to, to, to do that part. And they only start with the incremental delivery. And uh, some program even get canceled. Uh, I have seen like a big project uh, uh, that they went on for two years, like 50, like uh, many million dollars get canceled without having anything achieved. And here is what we think what's happening. Why Pilotin went well? The first one, because they have a small team, um, they get a small achievable goal that can they can focus on it and uh, since it's small sometimes they also get isolated or some of them they rely on a small part of the bigger organization so they don't have to align with them as much so communication overhead is also low with that they have high autonomy they can control every decision that they make they can control technical decision that they make, they can control all the architectural decision that they make. They get to meet customers, they get to get feedback, and they get to pivot, they get to uh, uh, change anything that they, uh, that, they, that, they, that they want. And most of the time, they have agile enabled team. And I'm, I'm not using the word agile coach because um, Usually, they, they come as a team. Um, this team, this Agile Enable team, you come in, they brought in the, the knowledge, they brought in the good um, practices, engineering practices, operation practices, uh, business practices, user experience practices. They kind of guide the, the team along. They can kind of build the Agile environment. They show them this is the DevOps culture, they show them this is the Agile mindset together with the team and they work together with like for a period of time and, and, and those teams will kind of like uh, learn from that experience firsthand. And this is one of the most important ones. Uh, they get the exception privilege from the executives. They got endorsed by the CEO um, it is important because this is the only way that they can lift the gatekeeper. So they walk in, this is, this is the, the jet from the emperor, and then they get everything they want. But it is also the, 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 the double-sided sword. If they use it too much, um, it will buy them back later. It will create the illusion of success. Once they, uh, once they scaled it out, you're not gonna get this badge for every team, and then they're gonna run to Chrome. So why, why scaling Agile team went wrong? So the first one is loss of interdependencies. So when you adopt the existing systems, you already have multiple teams working on it, and it's not, if it's not designed well, you, you can see like the dependency like cross like this, you change one thing, it might break some other things, so you have to align with them. And at the same time, some people will change some of their module, it will affect you, so they have to align with you. So it ended up that you optimize locally, you optimize within your team, but in a, as a whole, you still need to wait for everyone to go together, because once you chip one thing, you might need to test the whole application and then it's a high cost. It's a, um, it's a lot of investment in that. So you want to go fast, you want to deploy often, but you get blocked by all these constraints. So that brings the speed. Speed was bound to the 
to the weakest link to the uh, slowest gene. And that's why, as I said, mentioned earlier, like that's why only some teams ended up delivering something, and the, the other team failed, like the moral drop. Um, and also, they have information overloaded as well because they have a lot of things that they have to talk about. Uh, some of the projects that I have to be in the meetings all the time to kind of like understand what's going on with this. And then you can, you, you might see them in Scrum of Scrum, Scrum of Scrum of Scrum, stuff like that. And can, it can easily create Conway's Law. Um, I forgot the exact quote of Conway's Law, but it's something that like, you build something that will, it will represent the organization structure of your organization. Um, one of the work that I've seen was um, one team, they tried to build the functionality of the other teams. And I said like, why don't we ask them to change it for us and like give us like a library or API. And, and the tech lead said, oh, our team lead doesn't like each other, so I'd rather not to talk to them and we build our own. So it's like a lose-lose um, argument because you spend time building something that you reinvent the wheel and yet you have to keep maintaining it rather than using that time to do something that have a bring value to your own team. Another thing is not investing and fixing underlying problem before you lifting gatekeeper. So the agile usually bring in the characteristic of, of the team. Let's say if, if you have a good team, um, if you have a good architecture, if you have a good um, engineering practice, uh, you, you can make use of them efficiently. But if, you have, if your team have problems, if you don't have a good methodology in writing good tests, if you don't have a good way to uh, running test automation, if you don't have a good way to uh, deploy your systems, you're gonna, you're gonna get more feedback around that and it will, it will bring that problem, it will surface the impurity up and you run into like, I'm released often but I also get uh, defect often as well, or why I cannot release anything at all, which I try to release. So um, to make sure that when you l remove some gatekeeper, you have to make sure that you, you are ready for that as well. And, and this is uh, why the smaller, the pilot team, they got help from the agile enabler team. That's why they kind of get by from this, but when you scale, you cannot find the, the enable team that large to help everyone in your organization. And also, um, your legacy system is, can also be your, your underlying problem as well. Like if you fix everything, but if your legacy system is not built for scale or built for change, and then you have a high demand for change from many teams that you have, um, you might end up uh, crashing your systems. Or if you don't invest in the bandwidth or the, 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 uh, the, the, the power for the people who maintain it or make some change, you're gonna start with, this gonna be uh, holding you down, holding you back. And we, be, we believe that the right architecture can solve these problems. I, I'm gonna pass to Salah to talk about it. All right, thank you, Michael. All right, um, so uh, we have uh, our recommendation. Uh, basically, this recommendation is saying like, uh, you scale agile by putting scaling in the architecture and infrastructure, reduce uh, human process uh, bureaucracies, uh, don't scale by using process, and bring back those autonomy that we found in the that small teams. So uh, by doing, uh, to do that, uh, you need to start thinking of like, uh, from the technical point of view, maybe you have to start, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, segregate your, your product into subsystems, into sub-product, 
Uh, also, you need to make sure that uh, your developer, your operation team has a good uh, supporting tools that they can uh, run on. Uh, and also things such as uh, you need to balance between uh, the right amount of uh, bureaucracy and autonomy. Because you're now thinking of scale, you need somewhat of governance and you still want to keep that autonomy. So uh, I will start by talking about the architecture first. So um, to actually to do that, we need to, uh, I need to brief you about how typical legacy system usually work. Uh, basically, it's uh, mostly it's uh, what we call a big ball of mud or monolith application. Basically, it's a big application and all your teams are put into to work on this same code base. It might be uh, logically split into modules, but it's still on the same code base. For example, in this case, there's users, uh, modules, order modules, product modules, recommendations. Think of this system is like uh, e-commerce based systems. And basically all your developers are working on the same code base. And this code base, uh, basically uh, when many people try to work on the same code base, there brings a lot of pain, right? Uh, because think, uh, we need to communicate, we need to synchronize, we need to make sure everyone uh, put, uh, put the code in the right place. Um, and, uh, it, 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 and basically the developer, they need to understand the whole code base to, in order to make change in this. Uh, so it makes them difficult to, to understand and make change. And make change is also hard because changing one thing might affect the other part of the system. And, uh, and uh, basically by doing this, you are putting your eggs in one basket. So let's say if uh, there is one defect, one critical defects that stop you from uh, releasing, let's say a recommendation system has a defect in there and uh, you can't release because that's a severe one. Basically, you're, you're blocking other uh, team, uh, other uh, modules to get launched as well because you're launching this in a big, uh, big release that contains all these features, right? So this is the typical legacy system that you will see. Uh, so in an agile kind of architecture, what we promote is uh, how could we split these architectures in the right way where small team can handle their own stuff. Uh, basically, um, it boils down to a, syst uh, a subsystem, a distributed architecture that each team can handle their own stuff. We break uh, the monolith application into smaller subsystem by business capabilities. They're not breaking down by uh, uh, what you call uh, skills of the of of the people who develop, but it's a cross-functional team there, and every team every team there uh, handles everything from. Uh, the UI and the, uh, they have their own product owner, they have their own uh, uh, UI UX team, the developer QA until DevOps and uh, 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 whatever roles needed there. <laughs> and basically this creates autonomy inside one team, they can care, uh, and they can, uh, they, they start bringing back that characteristic of uh, that small team because they start feeling that uh, they, they can control this. Uh, from a developer's perspective, they, they start thinking of, oh, oh, this I can handle. This is small enough that I can put into my head and I can understand the whole system here. Um, and it, creates, it also creates sense of ownership, right? Because now this becomes your thing and you live with your team. It's a long living product that your team needs to live with. And uh, it's, it doesn't bound to, uh, to the other teams. If, uh, one team want to release tomorrow, it, it's fine. You just release your part. You don't need to care about the recommendation system because you define your schedule when you want to deploy. You don't, uh, and if, if recommendation system has a bug, uh, uh, let it be. I, I, my, I, my system is the user part. I can deploy that part. Uh, it's not related. And uh, scaling becomes easier by doing this. Uh, scaling in these terms uh, means scaling the architecture, scaling the development team. If I have more developers, I want to add in a, a team, or I want to set up a new team, 
that is easier to be done compare it with the monolith application and uh, but you can see here uh, from this uh, this uh, diagram you can see um, people when they start to uh, create this uh, microservice architecture one thing that on top if you can see the front end part is still a monolith application there's still pain there what it means that like from the front end part it's still a big code base there uh, if you happen to work in a very big front end code base you need tools like uh, uh, Redux, state management, MobX, all those stuff to manage because things get complicated easily. So that's why you need those kind of tools because you're working on everything over there and you still have the same problem uh, from the monolith in, the, in here. So what people start to think next is how could we also make microservice in the front end? And that basically, uh, there's a movement called micro front end architecture. Basically, uh, it's the same concept applied at the front end. So now one team, not only they own the back end, they also own the front end part. Uh, like a recommendation system, they own uh, the, the widget there that controls uh, what book I want to recommend to my customers. They, uh, by doing this, it enables uh, them to really own more because they can do many other things like A-B testing and they can uh, uh, display different kind of results, make change with the UI, all that stuff. And that enable teams to even do more and own more. And by doing this, you can actually, you know, mix and match your tools. In the front end, we'll if you are a JavaScript developer guy, you'll know the amount of library is enormous, right? There's Vue.js, there's React.js, uh, AngularJS, who knows uh, tomorrow what comes next, right? So there's a lot of tools. By doing this, basically, you can uh, pick and choose what, uh, uh, what, what team, uh, what library your team wants to use. And it's good, uh, and there's a way to abstract that. Uh, that the other team doesn't need to know, like what's the underlying uh, architecture or, or library that you use internally. So that's, by doing this you can see, it kind of reduced the interdependency between teams, because now you own your whole, your whole thing, right? You, you can manage this yourself. So, but uh, if you've done uh, development for a while, you know that in a microservice world, in a distributed architecture world, things still need to talk to each other, right? Like for example, this system, like recommendation system, it still requires some information from the products and some another information from the user. You still have that dependencies between each others, but uh, uh, if it, a small amount of dependencies like this at one time, it's still fine, but if you have too much, it becomes things like this. It's a dead star. Like you have runtime dependencies between each distributed architecture. If you've done it wrong, you're in a mess. You're even worse than creating a monolith application. Uh, I've seen many organizations, they move towards microservice because they want to do microservice without understand uh, the complexity of microservice and they end up being in this shape, releasing uh, their software requires every services to be released at the same time. Uh, kind of defeat the purpose of it all together. So, but this is really happening in the enterprise here. So uh, there's a technique to reduce these kind of uh, dependencies. Uh, things such as event-driven kind, event driven architecture that could reduce this. Basically, this is what it's saying is that um, you basically have a local copy of the information you need. Uh, uh, for example, uh, recommendation system, right? They need information from products, from users. Um, but uh, they don't really own the source of truth, but basically, basically if there's any change made to these two systems, it will propagate the events. It will create events, and that events will come to the 
recommendation system and it will make a copy of that information and you don't need all of those information right from a from recommendation uh, system what they need is basically a small field from the product uh, for example they just need like a product ID the product name and uh, probably the price right and they can just only keep that small copy of information with them uh, from the user they just probably need the user ID and the username that's it Right? They don't need the whole user information. But the point here is we have a local copy, uh, aggregation data of, uh, your syst uh, of the other people uh, information. By having this, it enables the team to make code simpler. They can own their data. It's much easier to maintain because uh, it's a local copy of the data in your database. It's more reliable. It's easier to code because it's just like a QE to your database, not an API call which can fail anytime. Uh, it's more reliable by doing this. Mm -hmm. So these are examples of like architecture that supports scale, right? You need uh, the team to be able to handle the product and to live with the product and to, uh, to, to scale and uh, evolution with the product. And not that's the architecture side, it's also the workflow and the platform that you need to build, that you need to invest in uh, to, to get here, right? So basically, what we need as well is to reduce those frictions uh, in, the, in the system that we have. Like all the, those gatekeepers that Michael mentioned, how could we, you know, make these things simple and easy and automated? So, of, you know, people can, you know, uh, make better use of their time. Like, uh, instead of letting the ops main, uh, you know, doing creating the VM manually all the time or doing the deployment manually all the time, why don't let them focus on something else, do more value, and uh, let these things be a script that can be automated. And same for the developer, right? They want to make change, they want to create new new things, make those things easier for them so they can focus on making change or creating new projects. Make those things, uh, more, make those set up frictionless for them. Uh, if let's say there's a new team joining, uh, I just open one ticket and, and automatically mail, send, send back to me, hey, this is your repository, it's everything done. If you follow uh, this template, you basically get everything out for free from the pipeline, from the metrics, from the other infrastructure stuff, you get it for free by just follow these templates and, and team can get uh, running very quickly. So, um, and also another point is uh, by creating this template, right? You also provide options for a team to, to pick and choose the right technologies uh, to solve the problem, so you keep the options open, but not too open. We'll talk more about that uh, in a few slides. And uh, another topic that uh, is important, is essential, essential for this, is how could we fix the the, the culture, make I and mean, bring back the the autonomy that we we were looking for when we have that small team. So one thing is the, the autonomy allow is you know, a playground to make fails and learn, right? We need that, we need that because now, because we have that architecture that the team uh, can own, they can start experiment, they can start doing A-B testing, uh, they can learn and, and they can fail and, and the limit, uh, the, re the area of, uh, of blast is limited because you control it. Right, we, by having this micro front end or technique like circuit breaker, basically reduce the area of blast into a limited section. Let's say like one day recommendation system, they want to try their new idea and suddenly they have a bug in there and it crash, but that crashes doesn't affect the whole system, but only affect uh, their part. But, uh, and they plan for that if there's any uh, uh, severe crash, do something else like uh, show the top top ten listed uh, products instead. So these things can be planned, and they can do A/B testing. So by enable this, 
uh, you need to also embed this into your infrastructure, meaning that when the team, when the team create new project, this kind of support should come out of the box. How could we make these things come out of the box for every team uh, can use uh, this technique right away? Um, also, there's an aspect of uh, control and autonomy, right? You don't want everyone to go crazy and use any tools or anything that they like, right? They want to have some control there because they're scaling, right? You need to have a good balance there. The things that you need to take care of, like cross-functional requirements, right? That things you, uh, not everyone will have the vision. You want to control somewhat of that. Uh, and there's techniques to maintain that, even at scale, right? Things, uh, practice like uh, introducing a fitness function, and basically fitness function is, is basically a, a, me a measurement of, uh, of your architecture, whether it's close to what you aim for. Like if basically you want to reach a high availability uh, cross-functional requirements, and you can inject these metrics into your pipeline and it can show that is, are you closing to that uh, aim that you're looking at, right? Uh, so govern things like infrastructures, right? So infrastructures are things that you want to standardize. Right, how to do logging, how to do security, how to do deployment, how to do A-B testing. That thing is basically what's called friction for the team to manage. Don't let the developer handle that. You uh, standardize that and they can just follow and, and do these things. And, uh, but you know, microservice sounds sweet, right? Everyone wants to do it. But actually, it requires lots of discipline, lots of hard work, lots of understanding of engineering practice. So not everyone can really get there. We see many uh, organizations trying to do microservices without, understand, without having enough maturity in their technical uh, engineering practices. It ends up in a big do. So, and you actually want to get there, you need the DevOps culture, and you actually get to the DevOps culture, you actually need all these engineering practice, right? You want to do continuous delivery, you want to do dark launch, you want to do blue-green uh, deployment, you want to make sure that your infrastructure is in, in, written in code so you can deploy it again and again, it's more reliable. Uh, to do, actually do that, you need an automated deployment script, right? And uh, and you need CI, and to do CI, you need to write tests, and you need to think about code ownership. And uh, today, where are we in Thailand? People haven't started writing tests yet. So think about that. So basically, this is what we've seen. And uh, it's, it's something that we should aim for, and we should be aware of that this comes with a price. So here's a key takeaway. So, for us, it means scaling agiles mean be able to respond faster to the market change, right? And to really be there, you adding more people to the team, to the project, to the product should not slow you down. If today, if you're adding more people to your team, your product, and slow you down, you're basically doing it wrong, right? Once you add 10 people, you should have a linear scale of it. Right, you want to you add more ten people. It should it should multiply by ten. Right, that's what you actually want. The speed that you're looking for, and basically to do that, put the investment of scaling in your infrastructure, in your architecture, and in your culture. That is our ask. Like invest in those things, uh, reduce those uh, process, human process. Right, it's a workaround basically. Uh, that's how we see it, uh, and uh, yeah, and these things is hard. This thing is not easy. This thing will take time, but uh, invest in it. It will take lots of hard work and money to get there, but be able to be overpass your competitor. That will pay off because you're optimizing yourself for speed of change. So, and that I think come to the end. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions?
we do have time. We have like 15 minutes. No questions. Very good, Michael. <laughs> okay. Thank you then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michael and Dean, for sharing. It's very interesting. And this is from Ajay. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the next session, 